Whether you love or hate Jamie Dimon, you got to know what this guy came up from. By the way, this guy was an assistant, a personal assistant in 1982 for American Express, working for Sandy Wild, where Sandy eventually ends up becoming the CEO of City. This guy's an assistant, regular guy, working for another guy. Eventually, whatever he touches turns to gold. Later on, he gets fired by Sandy Wow, and today, CEO of a company that processes, ready, $10 trillion a day in 170 currencies in 120 countries and named JP Morgan Chase is the most systemically important bank in the world by G20. When we learn about this man's come up, what he's done, you're finally going to realize why so many people behind closed doors want to see this guy run for office. So some people wonder, well, you know, is Jamie rich? How rich is Jamie? Well, let me just tell you, when it comes down to Jamie, do you know what he believes in a lot? Art. Do you know how big his personal art collection is? Take a wild guess. 10 million? 50 million? 100 million? 200 million. Come on, Pat. 900 million dollars. Here's a look into his 900 million dollar personal art collection, which has a hidden staircase, fake bookcases, and a secret vault. And you know why? Because this guy understands investments and alternative assets. And that's why today's sponsor is Masterworks. For some of you guys that are watching this, St. Pat, did I can't buy $900 million worth of art? I got real doors. I don't have fake doors or fake bookcases. I understand. But Masterworks makes it easy for you to invest in a $10 million piece of art and just buy a piece of share of it. Okay, whether it's Banksy, Warhol, Picasso, doesn't matter. That's what they do. They have nearly 750,000 users today. When you think about contemporary art versus select assets during high inflation periods, it's above three percent. Here's what it looks like: gold does roughly 0.2 percent, S&P does 3.8 percent, REITs do 5 percent, emerging market equities 12.6 percent, but contemporary art 23.2 percent during high inflation. You want to learn more? Click on the link below to learn more about Masterworks. If you get value out of this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. But before we go into how he became the CEO of the largest bank in the world, the most important bank in the world. How does the story really begin? This goes all the way back to his grandfather when he immigrated in 1921 and started a successful career as a banker. His father was also a wealthy stockbroker, would make Diamond look at balance sheets and earnings of a company, then determine what the stock price should be based on the financials. Let's just say he's got the right genetics so far. And then also it's fair to say that his family was upper class during his childhood, but Diamond was very ambitious and wanted to make his own fortune. He was rejected by his dream college, Brown, then he attended Tufts instead, which, by the way, is still a great school, but he was very angry about the fact that Brown said no to him. Then Diamond applies to get transferred to Princeton, gets rejected again. He eventually ends up graduating at the top of his class at Tufts and got accepted into Harvard Business School. And out of Harvard, he ends up graduating in the top 5% of his class. So you know how sometimes a lot of these big companies are like, we got to recruit that kid coming out of Harvard. He was number one in his class. That guy was number one in Tufts. That guy was number one in Brown. He's one of those guys that everybody wants to recruit. So rather than taking any of these offers, he decides to work for a family friend named Sandy Weil for a third of what everybody else offered him to make. Meaning, if others paid him 200 grand a year, Sandy could only pay him $70,000. And he said, no problem, I will work for you. So, so this is when the duo, Sandy and Diamond, go on a nearly a 20-year run together. And here's how it gets started. Weil ends up selling his company to American Express for $900 million and gets hired as the president and hires Jamie Diamond as his personal assistant at American Express. Weil quit after a disagreement with the company's board and Diamond followed him out of loyalty. Even though Weil said, you don't want to do this, you just started a family, kind of stay here. Why go is going to be probably risky for you. So why don't you stick around here? And Diamond's like, no, no, no. I'm following your lead. So once Wild knew he couldn't stop Diamond from following him, he says, look, let's start something here together. They end up finding commercial credit company, CCC, which gave credit to low-income households. Wild instructed Diamond to analyze CCC. Diamond eventually ends up finding hidden value in the company. CCC had a low return on equity, 4%, while competitors had 15% return on equity. Diamond realizes CCC has a lot of assets that could be sold and cost to be cut. Consider the company he could turn around. This next part is pretty interesting. They end up reaching out to Warren Buffett for some money and Warren Buffett says, I'm not interested. After Warren Buffett said no, they said, look, we're gonna use our own money. They end up using a significant portion of their own money to buy 10% of CCC and raise $850 million from IPO. They sold enough of the company to obtain an investment grade credit rating and while made Diamond the CFO and he laid off 10% of CCC's employees on the first day, 18%. ROE, return on equity, after one year of running the company, this caused the credit rating to increase. 
Eventually, when 1987 crash occurred, CCC had a healthier balance sheet than most competitors, so they began purchasing distressed companies. One of the distressed companies they bought was Primerica, and then eventually all of these companies together in 1998 turned into Citigroup. At the time, the biggest financial company in America. So, so while this is taking place, Jamie Dimon's aspirations was to eventually be the CEO of Citigroup. He doesn't become CEO, he does become the president, but Jamie in the back of his mind is like, when am I going to get my chance to be the CEO? At the same time, something very interesting happens. Sandy's daughter gets hired to work in Diamond's division, and Diamond had a major disagreement with Wild. While Vanguard launched the first low-cost index fund, Jamie wanted to use the same strategy and eventually wins the argument. Wild's daughter was responsible for the low-cost index fund division, and it was massively underperforming compared to the competition. Jamie scrutinized her and ultimately refused to promote her. So while all this stuff is taking place and Jamie's on track and all of a sudden, boom, November 1998, he decides not to promote. Sandy says, you're fired. And by the way, Jamie wasn't expecting this. Jamie thought for sure he's going to be the CEO. Matter of fact, both of them were asked this question afterwards. Jamie Dimon says, this impacted my net worth, but not self-worth. And Sandy Wiles said, I fired Jamie Dimon because he wanted to be CEO. The problem was in 1999, he wanted to be the CEO and I didn't want to retire. I regret that it came to that. I don't know what else could have been done except for him to be more patient. So both of them give their own point of view, but at the end of the day, he was fired. So imagine, you're the guy coming up, you're the superstar, now you don't have a job, what do you do next? But the market knows, this is a superstar. This guy's not gonna have a hard time finding a job. And he found a job very quickly. Jamie gets hired as the CEO of a struggling bank one, and here's what he does, year one, ready? He fires not 10 people, not 100 people, not 1,000 people, not 10,000 people. He fires 12,000 people year one. Can you imagine? Hey guys, Sandy, you know, fire Jamie. We're getting the best guy to be the CEO back home. This is awesome. Guess what? You're fired. <laughs> 12,000 people get fired and he cuts executive compensation. He took away company cars, 401k match and executive bonuses, gifts, financial planning, started selling underperforming parts of the business, took $4.4 billion in write downs and loan loss provisions. Bank One posted a yearly loss of $500 million in 2000. But guess what happened next? The company stock starts going up because Wall Street liked what Jamie Dimon was doing. And Dimon prioritized a fortress balance sheet more than anything else. This was kind of his philosophy. Lots of cash, good collateral, treasuries and gold, assets with real value, healthy amount of leverage, ready to buy things cheap. Bank One, just a year later, post profits, ready, of 2.6 billion dollars so obviously the market is saying oh my god look at this guy at first we thought he was crazy what are you doing firing all these people executive people are leaving saying he's the worst guy to work for you never want to work for a guy like this and then all of a sudden the market says damn this guy kind of knows what he's doing at the same time chase is struggling because they had the scandal with enron and they're kind of trying to figure out a way to figure this thing out and clean it up jp morgan merges with bank one in 2004 because it wants diamond as a ceo can you imagine you will merge with you the you know, main reason we're doing it behind closed doors, not telling anybody, we kind of want that guy to run the whole company. After the merger, JP Morgan is the second largest bank with Citigroup at first. Now remember, Citigroup was where he's, you know what I'm saying, Sandy and daughter and all that other stuff. So there's a point to prove right there as well. When Diamond took control of JP Morgan, he cut costs, reshaped incentive structure, started building his fortress balance sheet, immediately offloaded the toxic subprime loans. And meanwhile, Citigroup, complete opposite end, they're sitting there saying, hey man, this, this kind of, Subprime stuff is very profitable, man, we're making a lot of money here. This is great. This is looking so good. Until 2008, when a market hits. Jamie knew this was coming and it was going to be bad. And he didn't want JP Morgan Chase to have exposure to the moment he took over. Citigroup ends up losing, you ready? $18.72 billion in 2008. The company CEO, Charles Prince, was forced to resign November 2008. Chase had the smallest loss of all banks in 2008 with only $1.2 billion. Once again, 1.2 compared to 18.72. That's a big difference. So at the same time, when you think about 2008, a lot of these companies are going out of business, Bear Stearns being one of them. But Bear Stearns, you know, most companies can't afford to buy this company. So what happens? The government quickly identified that JP Morgan was the only bank capable of absorbing Bear Stearns, okay? The Treasury Secretary, Hank Paulson, begged Diamond to buy Bear Stearns. Diamond offered to buy 
for two dollars a share one year prior the stock was a hundred and seventy dollars think about this let's negotiate look jamie the year ago this thing was a hundred so we'll give it to you for a deal you know maybe 40 bucks maybe 30 bucks how about two dollars two dollars yes i'm the only guy that can do it you don't have another option Shit, he's right they eventually end up buying the company government sweetened the deal with a 30 billion dollar to reduce diamond's risk exposure diamond never acted like it was a luxury and said he did it for the financial system but wall street viewed it as a great deal for the bank because it helped jp morgan expand into areas like investment banking and prime brokerage dealing now a few other deals that he did 2008 wamu was the bank like i was with mamu back in the days it was the largest bank failure in u.s history jp morgan buys this company just in 04 it's valued at 330 billion dollars jp morgan buys it for 1.9 billion dollars pennies on a dollar 2015 they buy instamet 2016 they buy we pay 2023 first republic bank failure resulted in acquisition by jp morgan bargain price from the fdic second largest bank failure in u.s history so let me get this straight the largest he buys the second largest he buys because he's got this fortress of cash available to him to make these types of decisions when everything is cheap now there's obviously a lot of different takeaways from this there's a good bad and the ugly how could you how could you build up this guy haven't you seen the story about you know him being linked with you know, epstein and jp morgan bank involved with what they did how about the fact that during the time of him being the ceo of the company they paid nearly 35 billion dollars in fines how can we recognize somebody like this that they've had to pay these types of fines these are real numbers by the way and they're valid points but here's what i want you to think about here his leadership style let's take the best and then i'll tell you why some people want this guy to run for office number one there's something that he was famous for saying he said if there's a problem you tell me about it's our problem if there's a problem you don't tell me about it's your problem believe me you don't want to have a problem which means if something's not working talk about it with me and let's process it if you don't bring it up to me you best fix it or else you're fired that's my interpretation of how he runs the company number two involved in all aspects of the business from top to bottom using highly efficient meetings with agendas and action pointed to be addressed always carried around a sheet of paper with the topic needed to be addressed encourages transparency and direct feedback from all employees wants constant feedback from the people who directly deal with the customers and number one business philosophy was maintain the fortress balance sheet his friends say that he doesn't do much aside from run the business this guy is maniacal about running a company so now he gives a speech i'm going to play it for you I want you to watch and tell me what you think about this. Here's Jamie Dimon. It's the other way around. America has the best hand ever dealt of any country on this planet today, ever. Okay? And you know, Americans don't fully appreciate what I'm about to say. We have peaceful, wonderful neighbors in Canada and Mexico. We've got the biggest military barriers ever built called the Atlantic and the Pacific. We have all the food, water, and energy we will ever need. Okay, we have the best military on the planet, and we will for as long as we have the best economy. And if you're a liberal, listen closely to me in that one, okay? because the Chinese would love to have our economy. We have the best universities on the planet. They're great ones elsewhere, but these are the best. We still educate uh, you know, most, of, most of the kids who start businesses around the world. We have a rule of law, which is exceptional. If you don't believe me, and we talk about Britain, Brazil, Russia, India, Venezuela, Argentina, uh, China, India, Believe me, it's not quite there. We have a, a magnificent work ethic. We have innovation from the core of our bones. You can ask anyone in this room, what can you do to be more productive? Ask your assistants, factory floors, we do it. It's not just the Steve Jobs, it's this broad death. We're the widest and deepest financial markets the world's ever seen. Okay, and if you, I just made a list of these things, and maybe I missed something. It's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. And we have it today. Yes, we have problems. But you know, I, when I hear people down, if you travel around the world, I mean, get an airplane, travel around the world, and go to all these other countries and tell me what you think. So look, whether you like him or not, you know, you hear a message like that of somebody talking about how much they love America, I respect it. But when I see Putin selling Russia, I respect the fact that someone's got that kind of pride in their own country. I don't like the fact that a lot of Americans want to bash America. Finally, we got some leaders that are saying great things about their own country and they're proud. You want to hear more of that, so I like that part. In regards to you being uncomfortable with some of the business dealings or whatever, he's done $38 billion in fines, totally get it. You can talk about that as a bank. When you're around for as long as this guy's been around and the bank is as big as it is, it's going to have some weird customers. 2013, they cut ties with Epstein. You can read more about it and say, I don't like this. This is the reason why we never want a guy like this to run. What you can respect about a guy like this, 
is a few things. One, he chose the right person to run with for 16 years. And he became that person's number one flag carrier, Sandy Wild. You got to give him credit for running with that guy, being loyal, and look what happened to his career. Sandy won, he won. He loved the fact that he's running with somebody that's super hungry. Sandy loved the fact that he's got a guy that's willing to go out there and do the work. What a great partnership. Obviously, sometimes you bring a daughter in, you don't want to promote. That can be kind of technical and you know, you know, sensitive. It is what it is. That's one part. Lasts a long time, has a philosophy, stays clear to it, is about cash, calculated risk. There's a lot of things to be said about this. And his story is a story that somebody right now working at whatever position you're at right now, if you have the ambition, you're working behind closed doors to improve yourself, eventually one day you can do something big where people will say, I never thought he would be there. I never thought you would be at a position like this because no matter how much people laugh at you, only one person knows how determined you are about your vision and that's you. So there's a reason why guys like Ackman Bill Ackman and all these other guys saying it's a shame this guy's not running. So obviously there's a lot of other bills out there that want to see a guy like this run. You know, one thing about Jamie, he's always very diplomatic in the way he answers. I've spent some time with, you know, uh, uh, Goldman Sachs folks, similar. He'll say stuff like, hey, J Jamie, are you Republican or Democrat? Well, listen, you know, I I'm a Democrat in my heart, but I'm a Republican in my brain. It's kind of like gives those types of answers like, uh oh, should I get upset at him or not? Because he knows he's got Democratic clients and Republican, but eventually if this guy de decides to run, He's got to choose one party to be a part of. We're going to see what's going to happen. What a story to go from an assistant to all of a sudden you're running the biggest bank in the world. You got to give him credit for that part. If you got value out of this video, I got another one I want you to watch on generational wealth. What a story on Vanderbilt's, Rothschild, Medici family, what these guys did with their money. What did they do right and what did they do wrong? If you've never seen it, click here to watch it. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye, bye-bye.